Perfect. Great. Okay, well, first off, I just wanna say thanks uh, so much for this invitation um, to share uh, the work that we're doing and, um, and to take part in uh, what sounds like just a really interesting and wonderful speaker series. So this is great. Um, I wanted to start by just really acknowledging first, just in terms of what I'm presenting is really on the behalf of our, our group here. That is a very multidisciplinary group um, that uh, represents uh, my own background, as much, which is more social science, but we have people from biophysical sciences, whether it's physiology and nutrition, um, toxicology, and there's quite a range of people involved. And um, I'm grateful. I know there's a few of my colleagues that are on, uh, Francois Haman in particular, um, who is um, the physiologist who I've worked with right from the beginning of all the work that I'm going to be talking about. And um, if we get to the Q&A part that uh, there's questions more particular to some of the physiological and nutrition types of things that he would be um, better equipped uh, to answer those questions. Perfect. All right. So um, I will uh, begin by uh, just with a kind of an outline of what uh, I'll be talking about today. Uh, so I wanted to just first off even just start about my own position involvement in Indigenous health research. Uh, it's a bit of been a bit of an unusual journey and so I just wanted to go through that quickly. Um, I wanted to talk about the food security challenges and health implications, how our work really uh, originally started, uh, the local food efforts that we've been involved in over the past 15 or so years, um, and the um, the question that Mary is, you know, kind of what we're, we're really wrestling with right now. And, you know, how do these land-based foods contribute to the potential of dealing with uh, food insecurity in remote Northern communities? Uh, and then finally, just some concluding kind of comments. So to start, um, yeah, so this is, uh, I usually kind of just present the slide because my background uh, is really not around food. I was really, I started uh, in the area as an ethnologist, I study, uh, local cultural practices and uh, my work with um, Indigenous communities really started with a project uh, to study hockey in First Nations communities throughout Canada and uh, I received a grant and there was a bit of publicity and I was invited to communities to basically um, play hockey and learn about local expressions of this uh, of the sport and um, this is where it all started and it was amazing and really learning from um, the communities about how um, communities, first off, obviously played hockey, but how these were connected to other cultural practices and um, preparing um, the body and the, the spirit and all of this connecting. And one of the things that uh, people would do when I'd go into the communities, they basically take me hunting and fishing. And I was never a hunter growing up, but I like to fish and I like to be outdoors. So it was probably the best four or five years of my life at the time. And so that's where it all started. Uh, so one of the things that was quite apparent uh, when I was there, obviously food is a big part of any culture, but within the communities that I was working, it was um, dietary dilemma was something that was very front and center. Um, there's clearly two food systems that are uh, part of uh, traditional food, obviously, but a very um, under-equipped or ill-equipped uh, market food system primarily through Northern stores. If anyone's been up to the North and uh, from the North and recognizing that there's Pretty well a monopoly of, of stores and in, in, that are basically selling food at uh, pretty high prices and very often uh, not stocked with uh, very um, high quality food. And so uh, this is just kind of a reference to the fact that, you know, it's interesting that, you know, that this is just as someone who wasn't involved in, in food research, it's just something that uh, you're, you're really struck with as you first start working in the North. How our work started, uh, and again, Francois, if you can talk it towards the end of the presentation, um, basically I collaborated, collaborated with Francois um, because when I we started coming back from my field work doing the hockey research, I was talking about some of the foods and some of the, especially traditional foods that were um, perhaps not being consumed, um, things that were, uh, you know, interesting types of food species. And I would, would just talk about these different issues. And, but also at the same time, how important land-based foods were, but at the same time, the challenges of getting access to them. And so we started our project really trying to advocate for um, the enhancement of, you know, creating more opportunities for traditional food consumption, partly by trying to explain, obviously, the nutritional benefits, but I was, you know, obviously emphasizing more the cultural benefits. So we set up a project to really try to understand what would be the benefits. Could we, could we see um, actual health benefits from, from those who ate more traditional food versus those who didn't? 
And so we created a, a method to you know, work with people and through interviews and, and participant observation, kind of get a sense of one group that again, relied almost entirely or as much as they did from, from the land or at least a good portion of their diet from traditional food sources versus those people who were almost entirely eating from the store. And so um, the project really was three, like three stages. So my job was really to try to understand the extent of land-based food practices in these communities. And these are um, in participating communities up in Northwestern Ontario, in the north, uh, Northwest part of Ontario. And so hopefully you can see in the map where that Wapakika community is, which is one of our participating communities. Um, and we also, um, through different types of, of uh, physiological measurements, we were trying to understand would, would we see differences in type 2 diabetes in terms of um, 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 body weight, uh, other types of more sensitive kind of um, inflammatory markers. Could we find anything that would indicate differences uh, between those who had the two different types of diets? And uh, finally, we also had uh, a contaminant component to this, a to toxicology component, because we were, in, you know, obviously for advocating for these land-based foods, trying to understand are there any risks associated with these foods was also a really important element. And I don't want to dwell too much on this because it's not really the focus of the study, but I just wanted to give you a sense that for the most part, we didn't see any real health benefits in terms of subtle markers, in terms of um, inflammatory markers. There really weren't, we couldn't see really any differences that would say, suggest, yeah, the, this was, this was important. In fact, what we found was quite discouraging. We found um, really um, some of the highest numbers in terms of, of type 2 diabetes, like basically one in three people were type 2 diabetic. And sorry, these are people over 18. I should point that out. Um, and, you know, the rate of obesity was around 66%. It was, you know, not a very good news story in, in, in either group. The only thing we did see in terms of differences were those who basically ate more from the land had a higher contaminant profile compared to those who didn't. So this wasn't a very good news story. And so um, when we reported back to leadership, um, one of the things they basically told us that was that they already knew that. They already knew that there were problems with obesity and there was problems with diabetes and there's other health issues. They knew this already. They already knew the fact that um, there was issues around access that, you know, Traditional foods, land-based foods were very important to people and, and to cultural ways, but getting access to these, issues, to these foods was a real problem. So um, basically what we were finding is that the amount of wild food that was consumed was quite minimal in terms of what they were actually eating. So most of the food, even if you're in the group that ate more land-based foods, still ate predominantly from the store, which we, were these you know, energy dense, very low quality types of foods. And so, um, that became kind of the, um, the drive, which, you know, kind of has driven us and still today is what we really do focus on, which I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about again, before I started dealing with some of these other questions. Um, but we started to look at funding opportunities that were a bit, um, even though we obviously we still try to get to your, you know, like tri council funding, we were looking for other sources of funding that would basically support what the communities were actually asking for. And that was really to help build um, their food capacity to try to get more access to some of these food sources, but also even look at uh, alternative um, um, food development models that we were trying to able to, we were able to support. And luckily, we really did fall into some quite major funding through um, different funding organizations that basically um, looked at helping to develop the food initiatives that the communities were basically um, looking to help develop and and. And the funding, it was interesting how the funding worked, that it, what, there weren't any strings attached. So communities could come to us and uh, say, well, we know we really want to do um, land-based food training. We want to teach our youth. We want to have an intergenerational component. Some people wanted to invest in things like gardens and, and greenhouses. And some you know, wanted to really just augment their ability to get infrastructure to get on the land. And so we really let their um, communities, uh, let the communities kind of drive what the, the funding initiatives were about. Um, but we also provided a, um, a, um, a, a component that basically looks at um, the evaluation. How do we, if you're going to get funding, one of the biggest roles is to, to help determine, well, did it work? Are we really making a difference in terms of the food security challenges or chronic disease prevention that ultimately um, was you know, our, our main goal in terms of the projects? And so that was really um, how, it all, uh, how it all started. And so just to kind of give you a, just a kind of an example of just a couple of the initiatives. So the Wapakika Hoop House project was something that 
Um, I mean, up until the pandemic, obviously, where I, mean, I, I should let you know, all of our research has been shut down since um, since uh, March, I guess, or even before that. Um, so, um, which is really, really not great in terms of keeping momentum going. So having people on the ground and doing these things is really important. But this one particular project uh, started uh, quite a few years ago, probably, probably the, the original garden started in 2010, but there's been um, other things like this hoop house project that we did with um, the school um, with very, this was actually a very simple um, little bit of funding and just trying to look at you know, extending growing seasons by three weeks on the, on the, you know, on each end, you know, extending it to basically six weeks. Um, and it was quite successful. And I think partly because uh, I'm not a builder, I don't really know what I'm doing in terms of building. And so the hunters, even when they would come by and see what I was doing, were clearly recognizing that I didn't know what I was doing and they would get involved and um, it became a real community project, even though there was just a few, you know, people from the health uh, department that were involved. The hunters really took over and basically built the thing. And I was uh, trying to do the best I could that looked like I knew what I was doing. And um, we had the school involved. And so each, uh, each of the classrooms were involved in their own garden bed. And, um, and then we found, you know, again, really involving the school and activities has been important if we're thinking about sustainability, partly because school happens every year. Um, so tying activities to the school um, has been quite successful. And so this is, um, this is ongoing. And um, this is just, again, one, one, uh, one example. Um, another project that was um, through funding through uh, Health Canada and their Climate Change Adapt Program. And this is with the, with the Castle Monica Lake First Nation. Um, again, very, it's basically, it's all part of the same tribal council as Wapakika. So this is very specific in terms of Northwestern Ontario, where I've been working for the past most of, the, most of our time. Uh, or at least for my side of the, our projects. Um, and this project, again, it was up to the community to determine well, what did they want to, how did they want to address the food security issues in relation to climate change? And so again, drawing for um, pr providing training to uh, youth uh, on how to get on the land, um, especially in, uh, you know, in the winter and um, getting, uh, you know, traps, uh, you know, fish nets set, set under the ice. Um, I have my, uh, one of my students uh, help with the kind of a, after school cooking program, which again was a huge success and is still going on. And we're still um, working with one of the teachers there. They have a pretty neat kitchen connected to their school. And, um, you know, trying to, part of the, what was really great about this project was that um, we really did emphasize what was available in the store and what was around them for any of the cooking um, um, program or classes that we were doing um, to, to try to make very uh, easy and affordable recipes. And um, another component of this was also um, working with the school again on a uh, community garden, which uh, had already kind of started, but we basically went in and uh, worked with the, all the different um, ages of, of the children to basically get together and uh, put these things uh, in place. And again, um, I, again, I wasn't able to go up in the spring because of COVID, but um, my uh, friends up in Casabonica were sending me pictures. It was actually way better this year, even than when we started. Um, it was uh, partly because a, a really great uh, energetic teacher that's in the, in the school who's um, really got the kids engaged and the garden has been uh, phenomenal and um, hopefully maybe, you know, fingers crossed, um, if not spring, we'll go back up in the summer at some point and help continue with that, uh, with these initiatives. So um, again, it's a lot of lessons learned through these, through these activities in part, again, thinking about this idea of the sustainability. So it's one thing to go up. Um, you know, how do you continue, how do you um, in maintain the engagement? Uh, and, um, and so these were, uh, so we've written a few papers about it, but it's really kind of the, trying to, again, uh, work with the communities to, to um, work with them to ultimately figure out solutions and how what they feel are the best ways to uh, develop this local food capacity. Um, and so What's a bit more discouraging with all this is that again, over 10 years, again, probably close to 15 years, um, we've been um, working with communities, trying to, you know, again, develop these, uh, these local food strategies and to build food capacity. Um, but the impact from at least a food security perspective or from a, just a food intake um, perspective, um, it hasn't really increased food production by very much. And that's been kind of discouraging because even though it's great seeing the, the you know, everyone together, the, the cultural aspects of this, the mental health components, all of these really wonderful things that are happening in terms of actual food production, getting food to people's plates has been quite minimal. 
if we think about this from a, a land-based traditional food perspective, because that's still been something that's um, obviously, it's really important for us in particular because it's still pr the primary kind of food um, source for the people in the community that we work in. And um, are these, uh, is there enough even wild food in, in, the, in their environment to actually make a difference? You know, can they increase the capacity, their harvesting capacity? And so the, um, the other aspect of this is the food distribution, which we, you know, again, it's very delicate. I mean, how, you know, we think about food sharing and other food uh, distribution models, you know, as a way to get food to who are um, um, needing it most. But again, when we think about a, with the communities that we work with, I mean, for the most part, food distribution has literally, or has, has been more in terms of um, the networks, these informal networks that people have that is more based on reciprocity than just simple charity. So when we think about something like um, donating to, you know, the community centers and things like that, which, which does happen, for the most part, they, the food really goes through a reciprocal uh, exchange where um, it might not be food in exchange. It might be if someone's watching their kids or, you know, there's always some sort of type of exchange that has gone on historically and still today. And so oftentimes those who are needing it most aren't getting access to it. And so that's another uh, huge component, which I'm not even really going to touch on uh, for today's, um, uh, for today's discussion. Uh, but what's interesting is that, so um, as part of Canada's uh, food policy initiative and the reworkings of Nutrition North, there's been a considerable investment in um, traditional food or again, whether we're talking country food or traditional food or land-based food, whatever, you know, our communities generally just refer to, refer to it as traditional food. Um, for the most part, um, there, you know, th this, there's funding available now for community organizations and communities to basically get support for uh, increasing or getting on the land and, and bringing this in. So it will be subsidized through this kind of Nutrition North program, which um, I've talked to some uh, Health Canada uh, people who are involved in this and they're still trying to figure out, you know, how the money, how much money, who gets what, and you know, how does it work in terms of the mechanics. Um, but it's a really great um, initiative. And, and obviously communities have been calling for this, indigenous communities throughout Canada have been calling for this for a long time. And so um, the fact that, you know, even though there has been some debate about the listening and, and the actual real full stages of consultation and engagement, um, it's still, it's, it's a sign in the right direction. But at the same time, the question is, you know, the funding initiatives, what can it actually do to actually contribute to um, food security in terms of like truly in the sense of, can it increase the availability of um, these nutritious foods uh, for community members? And so that's what we've been really working with as a, as a research group, trying to understand this. And um, one of the things that we have been doing, and I, I put a reference to the chapter three of our book, uh, Land Not Forgotten. And one of the things that we've been doing with communities, and at one point in time, we had nine different communities from Yukon out through um, all of Northern Canada, from uh, Northwest Territories, Ontario. And we had um, been working with communities, trying with this, with this you know, pretty large funding envelope trying to get a sense of, okay, if we're investing in this, let's see how much food is being produced. What's the outcome of all this? And so in that chapter, I, I really pr present a pretty discouraging um, figure where it was really quite limited in terms of what was actually being generated or produced as a result of this funding. And, um, you know, so we thought, okay, well, part of it is the reporting. It's really burdensome to ask community members to basically document and, and record every yield, especially if you think about this, it's one thing in terms of gardens because it's a you know um, garden production is a bit easier but if you're thinking about something like fish where there's literally thousands of fish coming in and if you're thinking about we need to start weighing and you know sizing fish and um, counting fish and it, and it happens all year and to basically put that on even a paid community member I mean it would be a real massive investment and again to do it over one year I'm um, really is a snapshot and so we were trying to figure out is there a better way to get an estimate in terms of what food, what's the kind of energy that's available on the land, um, and what difference could it make if we looked at, you know, different optimizing of um, harvesting techniques. So before I wanted to get into that, one of the things that it's, um, I wanted to kind of stress uh, on the audience today, and I'm just trying to be aware of time here, is that um, our work has really been based on getting an understanding, a firsthand understanding of what it, what's involved in actually going on the land. And it's one thing to talk about, um, yeah, we, we want more hunting, more fishing, and we want these activities to take place. 
It's a tremendous amount of work. There's a tremendous amount of cost and tremendous amount of knowledge that is really generationally um, disappearing. That it's, it's very difficult. I mean, in the communities we work with, there are people who like to hunt. That's how I like to say it. And then there's hunters who actually know what they're doing and can access lands in very uh, remarkable ways. And so what we've been trying to do is cost, you know, when people are getting on the land, what's the cost of this? What is it, what is it costing them to bring this food back? What are the yields? We're still trying to work that out. And again, what's the eventual potential contribution to chronic disease prevention or increasing food security? And so in this region, so again, and I'm not sure what, where the audience is in terms of where everyone is. We think, and when I first started, when I went up north, I'm like, wow, this is like the great white north, boreal forest, land of abundance, like going out, I'm just gonna see moose all over. I'm gonna like be tripping over them. And so it was like, yeah, this is, this is quite remarkable. And I really wanna point out that this is a very regional specific talk. And so what we're talking about is one specific region. And so in Ontario, if you look at the very, I don't know if you can see this, um, you know, so Thunder Bay is over here atop of Lake Superior. And then if we blow this up a little bit, um, this is Angling Lake is basically, this is kind of that Northern part of that Northwestern Ontario. This is the, the Wapakika First Nation. And up here around all this kind of area here is kind of their traditional um, harvesting land. And so unlike the slide before where you see quite a bit of forest and, and the abundance of the boreal forest, what this region in is, is a very difficult, very, um, it's, it's a land of muskeg. Um, it's very difficult to access. It's actually, um, it's not that abundant in terms of food resources. And I'll talk about this a bit more later, but um, it's just massive swaths of land um, sparse with vegetation and with um, animal food sources. And so um, it's really important to understand the context when we think about, yeah, let's, let's increase the volume in terms of what we're harvesting. I also wanted to point out, so when I pointed the image, so in Wapakika, so there's hunting that goes on around the community. Um, and this is again, a permanent settlement, which I'll describe a, a bit later, but in terms of the harvest, the real main harvest is really spring and fall. And people generally leave the community and, and go to these um, traditional hunting areas where um, they're able to get greater, greater volumes in, in terms of yield. And so again, not an easy trek. So when Francois and I went on this, the, the last trip, the last fall uh, major hunting trip, um, basically we went through all stages of the activity. And, and first off, it starts from just getting to what Wapakiki is a flying community of 440 people. Uh, so there's no road access except during the winter. So we go to a flying community and then we need to get into a float plane um, to basically get to where the hunting land is because it's, it's so difficult to navigate by, by boat. So land access and how we access land is incredibly important for this talk in the sense that um, people who have different access to land and waterways will have different access to food. And so um, it starts by plane. Um, and then these are multiple planes because there's, there's more than just a, a couple people with all the supplies. So it's very expensive if you think about trying to get um, to get to these regions. And then I was just so, show you one, I'm wanting to play the full clip. This is incredible to, to participate in. So this plane takes us to a, their kind of the main kind of base camp kind of thing. And then we go by boat in little 14 footers, six and a half to seven hours um, through these winding um, waterways that are oftentimes having to jump rapids, having to um, navigate rocks that will take your boat down. Um, these guys are, are, are geniuses as they navigate. And I would, you know, you're sometimes white knuckling in the boat, just hanging on going, I can't believe. And, and they will do this in the dark. It's incredible the skill that these guys have in terms of accessing um, where they need to get to which again is a huge thing. I and mean, then we think about the generational knowledge. And so um, the other aspect of this, which I just wanted to, again, I'll, I, won't, uh, I won't show you the whole thing. Um, this is um, a walk that doesn't maybe look as difficult as it is, but I walked for about an hour and a half and I literally thought I was gonna die. And this is basically getting through um, about a kilometer and a half of, of, of land just to simply get to, um, and, and just kind of showing the vegetation and, and, and the land that's there. So one wrong step and you're in bog, like up to your waist, um, you can see uh, why winter is so important. So I would say in terms of, you know, for the, for the hunters at least, winter is their favorite season. 
So starting now or starting, you know, a month ago, you know, once they can get their skidoos through here, it makes a big difference. But if you're going in to get food, I mean, your skidoos, if, unless you're chasing the moose with the skidoo, um, once the, sn the snow gets too deep, you're literally trying to walk through the snowshoes and it's incredibly physically demanding. And so, again, I think a lot of people think that it's, it's all just, you know, again, guns and boats and, and snowmobiles, tremendous physical um, demands uh, in order to get this, uh, this done. And um, if Francois can attest to this, I don't know if we're going to do this trip again, because I don't know if we have uh, the energy to do it ourselves, but um, it was quite remarkable. Um, so this is the actual place where we went. You can see the size of the boat. So what's really important here is understanding. So once the moose is actually if, uh, harvested or, or, or we were able to get the moose, it has to be brought back. And so one moose will fill this entire boat. So if you only have two boats going, well, how do you get the moose back? And so it's one thing to say, well, we're gonna increase the volume, the amount of time, the amount of fuel, and, and I'm, I'm, not even, um, I'm not even talking about, again, the cost and you know, how strategic you need to be to place fuel uh, along the way. This is all done like way, well in advance in order to be able to execute these trips. And so they will oftentimes call a float plane when the weather allows for them to go in and then we'll bring the moose back to the community. So again, really augmenting the cost. Um, and so the reason why I'm going to show this one particular little graphic is, so if you think about Angling Lake in this one area, it's basically a permanent settlement, which really when, you know, when Treaty 9 was signed in this area, you're thinking about 1904, nothing really happened in terms of permanent settled development until the 1930s when the treaty, the, the adhesions to the treaties. And we're seeing ultimately, um, concentrations of people in one particular area. So it really depletes that one um, place. And so historically, and again, thinking about this ecological balance between needing to survive on um, what is again, very difficult terrain and with limited food resources, populations, they were, hunting groups were about 15 people. They were, um, it was basically kinship types of arrangements where people would follow food sources through tremendous tracts of land. As soon as your population, your group got more than 15, it made it, it wasn't sustainable. And that's why the numbers were the way they were. So now to think about permanent, permanent settlements that were imposed upon these communities where you have 400 people plus, 400 is actually a small community, where they're now, um, again, have depleted their food sources in that area, they're needing to ultimately travel uh, much further, um, which means uh, there's an increase in cost, there's an increase in risk, um, it decreases the ability to ultimately bring food back because again, if you're in the spring, for example, they often have to call in helicopters because the melt happens too quick and they need to get the food back. And so incredible amounts of money to basically think about, you know, if we are going to, um, you know, increase our reach and again, deplete further, again, it ultimately has a huge impact. And so I wanted to really emphasize that before I get into um, the last kind of 10 minutes of this. So, um, just to kind of give you, give you a sense. So again, what I was mentioning before, what we had been trying to do, and again, there's, there's examples of studies where people had, have done really diligent work, you know, trying to um, work with communities and, and get a sense of, okay, well, how much is coming in and, and you know, measuring the energy based on um, the yields themselves. But again, unless you're doing this over, you know, periods of time, like quite a few years at a time, ultimately you're not able to get a real assessment because one year you might get 20 moose, one, the next year you might get 60 moose. And so to do it for one year is really not a very um, useful predictor of food. And so what we did was we thought about this the other way and said, well, why don't we look at um, based on the, um, you know, what people are telling us in terms of how much they're able to bring in, what food sources are eaten. Let's think about this um, in terms of what are the energy needs of the community? And so again, my colleagues on the nutrition side and physiology side were basically, you know, were able to kind of determine based on the age and, and the other demographics in terms of, um, you know, uh, sex and all the different um, aspects in terms of what impacts your uh, total energy um, requirements. Um, they basically estimated that, well, not even estimate, actually, that's the one part we predicted um, um, very accurately through scientific methods to basically determine well, what's the energy requirements of the community. And we also were then trying to figure out, okay, well, let's look at, you know, what's ultimately the requirements based on the amount of protein, the amount of carbohydrates and uh, the amount of lipids. 
And so, you know, basically 55% carbs, 30% lipids and 15%, you know, are kind of general numbers in terms of energy requirements, how that makes up your total energy intake. And so um, requirements and the other thing uh, or expenditure, I should, I should say, the other aspect of this is that what we're working from are base base models. So this is completely sedentary. So our numbers are very low predictors in terms of actual requirements. We just, let's start with the base and let's see what this, what this brings us in terms of need. So I'm not sure how well everyone can see this. And these are a couple of busy slides that I'll present, but basically if we looked at, if you look at here, just first off, if, if you're not really taking into consideration the organs and other types, types of tissues that communities very much eat. But in terms of the overall, if you're looking at the mass in terms of what they need from a, just, a, just a pure kind of food security kind of perspective, I mean, primarily the, the traditional food is, is almost, well, it's almost all water, but the rest of it is protein, very small amounts of lipids. Um, and very, um, and you have to be very deliberate, even in terms of, you know, um, storing how you're able to capture um, fat in, in these animals, which again, traditionally is very important, but again, pr predominantly um, protein. And so if we look at that, we say, okay, well, if to meet 15%, um, we would have to then think about, okay, well, how much food in, are people eating? And in terms of types of food and what, what have you. And we were originally thinking about, okay, well, if we ask the people, you know, does the majority of your food come from fish? Does it come from moose? Does it come from um, birds and waterfowl? What's the best way to look at it? So we had kind of a rough estimate, but we kind of, for the most part, were able to do it in a different way by saying, okay, we know moose is one of the things that um, people have a really good sense of how much moose are generally captured over the year, how much caribou. The, the land mammals is something that is it's easier to count. The birds themselves, again, it's a pretty good indicator of saying, okay, well, if we're gonna look at 15%, trying to reach 15% of energy requirements, again, thinking mostly proteins, that hitting that 15%, this is the total of animals that they would need to actually harvest. They need to get 54 moose, 127 beaver, which again are numbers, which I'll explain in a few minutes, the amount of birds, and then you'll see basically the amount of fish. And so fish here is about which is from what they were tell what people were telling us in terms of dietary intake, about 50% of the food consumption, traditional food would come from fish. The fact that it's just available pretty well throughout the year, okay? Um, and so uh, this is the amount, and then, so you look at the, the actual tonnage, you know, so we have 38,000 uh, kilograms basically of, of traditional food that would need to be harvested every year. Um, the, the fact ultimately, if we were looking at this from say, um, the middle one here, this middle column. So 15%, if we were to look at 15% of, um, of protein or of total energy intake, so let's say 100% of your, what your protein requirements, so 15% of overall um, energy requirements, and think, okay, well, this is where they would need to be. They need to be getting 75 large mammals, that's combined moose and, and um, caribou, about 201 small mammals. And then you start looking at the, the increase in terms of the amount of birds and then the amount of fish. And so what this represents here, if they were to basically get this much, they would still re require at least 40% from the store. Where they are based on the numbers in terms of what they're telling us in terms of what they're generally getting is around say 37 to 40 um, you know, large mammals. And just to let you know, moose is the primary one. There, are, there is a bit more caribou consumption. There's quite a bit more caribou availability, but it's not really the food that's consumed as much. So we have around, um, you know, that's a kind of target that would make sense. Um, and so we have around, say, um, let's say in terms of birds, you only have about 100, so about 100 beaver, let's say. And then your fish uh, would be around here. This is still probably heavy in terms of the amount of fish that they would be able to harvest in the year. But you can see that would make up 30% of the diet if that's where they were. Basically here is like going, okay, well, if you're looking at 25%, Basically, none of the amounts, none of these targets in terms of what would be available uh, in terms of one, it's just simple availability in terms of that they're not there. And two, even if they were, the ability to harvest them, the hunters are explaining, it's just not, it's not possible. So we're looking at potentially maybe 7.5% of overall energy by what's happening right now. So again, I want to leave time for questions. I only have a couple of minutes. So I just want to kind of wrap this up. And so what we're basically seeing in a community that we, what again, when we might think, wow, this is a very remote community, have, having access to wild food resources, uh, it's small, um, it's, it doesn't have um, other encroachment from other um, types of industries for the most part, at least yet. Um, 
this is very difficult to even reach 7.5% energy requirements. And so um, if you increase this, again, you're going to increase costs. You're going to uh, think about the danger, the risks that are going on, especially in terms of changing weather patterns, which the hunters have talked about. Um, and so this is something that is um, important. And then also I wanted us to think about the fact that this is one region. And so it's very different. For example, when uh, Francois and I were in Telegraph Creek, for example, in Northern British Columbia, very interesting um, kind of harvesting that is much more localized. The, the, it's much more abundant in terms of the land, in terms of the food sources. So what's interesting is like what, trying to think about this model and scaling it up, trying to think about working with other communities to figure out what opportunities are there because if the government is going to be investing as they're saying, um, the government really needs to be informed of, you know, how can their money, how much money would they need to spend to actually make a difference? And is it, you know, possible to even increase the amount of food access that's already currently being invested in? And so I'll just leave it at that. And again, I'm hoping I've left enough time for questions and sorry for, there's so much that I'd like to get through, but um, anyway, we can maybe have discussion and um, go from there. But thanks, thanks very much again for um, listening, letting me chat. Thank you very much, Michael. It was, uh, it's fascinating research and it, it certainly gives us a, a, just a glimpse of, of uh, the complexities and the challenges of food access in the North. Um, I'm just going, I think we're already getting questions in, so I think we'll just go right to the questions for the sake of time, if that's okay with you. So the first question is from Mena, and uh, she says, very interesting. Uh, thank you for doing this. The question is, why is obesity used as an indicator of health? Yeah, um, well, so... For the most part, I mean, obesity isn't. Um, this was just one of those kinds of um, aspects in terms of where we're seeing other complications, in particular in terms of type 2 diabetes. Um, I can let Francois, if you're on the call, if you can um, address this is this is something that Francois is quite um, sensitive about as well. But Francois, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I can respond to it. I kind of sent a quick response. So I don't know if it was clear, but essentially, the I totally agree. Like we have to be careful with obesity because it's used in very different ways. And obesity is a disease. So it has to be viewed as the increased risk of metabolic uh, syndrome. So dyslipidemia, high blood pressure, type two diabetes. So when we talk about diabetes, uh, obesity in this case, we do talk about it as the, the risk of the disease. So it's not just a question of how much fat you would have. It has nothing to do with really, it kind of can aggravate the situation, but it's more the question of the disease. So. Uh, which is the definition that World Health Organization uses. So I'm not sure if that answers the question. I kind of send a quick answer back after that question. Perhaps if there's anything further on that, uh, uh, um, Nina could put it in the chat box. Thank you, Francois. Uh, the second question from Ben is, oh, I guess, sorry, that one's already been answered. Uh, from Victoria. Great talk, Michael. Um, the hoop garden is a great idea, but I'm wondering if any kind of food systems were considered that would provide food and also relieve pressures of fishing off the land. Specifically, I think of on-land closed system aquaponics systems that produce both fish and vegetables with potential for self-sustaining system. Yeah. Um, Oh, just one more part to that was or is anything like this being considered or introduced and how do you think northern indigenous communities would feel about this kind of system yeah that's really great so um we're actually um partnering and so i can see cindy godet is there as well so we actually partner with um uh, the moose cree first nation and moose factory and so that was um partly through connections with uh, Cindy and the work that she had done for her PhD and she's still working with us with uh, Moose Cree. So they actually have the aquaponics um, um, process that's taking, um, that's actually being instilled and um, they're working towards developing that right now. It's a massive um, amount of money to get that going. Um, there are great examples of things um, that are much more sophisticated than what we were working with um, in our community uh, in Wapakika. And one of the reasons why um, one of the things that I, I wanted to stress is that when we work with communities, one of the things that we need to think about is the ability to um, one have the capacity to, to scale up or to do things like so if you create a bigger garden, it means more work. 
And most people who are working in the community say, hey, I got three million bucks for a project. A lot of the people are so overtaxed and overburdened with projects already. They're the ones that get the project and they're going, oh my God, I don't wanna, I don't wanna take this on. And so uh, what we were trying to think about were really simple, um, that doesn't require much expertise, um, that it was very easy to set up, easy to take down, it can be extended very limited in terms of labor um, and background knowledge. I mean, if I can grow anything, I mean, anyone can. And, um, and so that was really the mindset. And I think it's, there's, some, there's some real power to that, that it's been easy to manage. And I think that's when we're working with communities, especially smaller communities with limited um, um, support. And um, it's, it, I think it's an interesting approach, but you, there's, there's great examples of super sophisticated things, very successful throughout the North, actually. Thank you. Um, Trevor is asking, could you talk about your advice for settler researchers working to improve health in Indigenous communities? In your experience, how should researchers, researchers approach this relationship and the power dynamics therein? Uh, that's, that's a really great question, Trevor. I, I, um, I, I get that question a lot and I, I feel um, guilty responding like by saying, well, you have to develop the partnerships and you have to develop trust, which is ongoing. And, I mean, I, it was so serendipitous for me, the way it happened. I mean, I was literally through this hockey project invited into communities, the trust and the kind of friendships that I developed was really because of that, you know, those first four or five years that I was doing that. Um, and it would be very different for me to just suddenly go up and say, hey, I want to, you know, measure um, contaminants in people or I want to study your food system. It was, um, it, it was very different. And so, I mean, the only thing I can say is, um, you know, work mutually. The idea of community-based research, I think oftentimes is overstated. I think people are saying, oh, I've got an idea. I called the community, they say they're on board. I mean, to me, really community-based and community-driven really needs to be ideas coming from communities with the questions that they want resolved. And then we as researchers, indigenous or settler, um, kind of coming in and saying, you know, can I, can I support that? And I think that um, goes a long way to building trust and, and rapport. Great, thank you. Um, Jackie asks, uh, in terms of access to land-based food security uh, getting more difficult due to climate change, would caribou farming work um, or our greenhouses aquaponics uh, was another part of that as well. Have they, have they talked about that at all? In, yeah, there's been discussions around, I wish uh, Courtney, my other um, collaborator, um, who works in Fort Providence. I know they've had kind of discussions around that. And um, I mean, I, 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 can't, I can't answer that from a scientific perspective to say, yeah, I think this is the way to go. I mean, I think in, it depends where you are. I mean, it, like there's places that really don't need to be thinking that way. I mean, there's been so many mistakes in terms of aquaculture. There's been, I mean, I'm, I've always just been kind of nervous about the idea of domesticating or trying to um, control species in that way. I don't have the expertise to, to to, to say, I mean, I think for the most part, for me, it's, it's trying to support communities with their ability to harvest the, the resources that are there. Um, it, and I think to a certain extent, even maximize what's there. So caribou, for example, there's quite a few caribou in the communities that we work in, um, but it's just not a desired food choice for most. I mean, it's so, it's, um, they'll drive by them on skidoos and, um, and, and sometimes in, you know, 10 at a time or whatever, but um, they drive by them, so. Is, uh, I'm just curious, is that a cultural thing or? Yeah, so I mean, that's just again from, that's, it, it must be, and I, you know, I talk to people. And so what's interesting is that um, more people are starting to eat it. Um, it's just not a preferred food choice. I mean, historically, I'm, I, you know, people would eat what was available around them. I mean, so even something like the first project that Francois started uh, and I started, it was on the, um, a, a fish, a burbot, the lingcod that people don't eat anymore, but um, the elders talk about it. It's like a critical food source. So, um, you know, there's politics and culture around food. And um, so it's not for me to be saying, oh, you should be eating that. Thank you. Um, Selim asks, were there any concerns around possible contamination of the land or animals or changes in animal uh, behaviors such as migration? So, uh, yes to all of that. I mean, 
uh, I was just saying, it's so weird in Ottawa. Uh, I've never the, the geese are migrating right now. It's so weird. I've never seen geese migrate at this time. So the past three or four days, it's it's really odd. And so, the, I mean, the people in the communities have talked about uh, my, migration patterns changing. Um, even caribou, which again, I, for some communities are seeing caribou that they haven't seen before. Um, so that was that's definitely going on. So the issue of climate change is something, and adaptation is something that's uh, paramount to all the communities I work in. Um, the issue of contaminants is something that um, we definitely found local sources of contaminants, which was um, a really difficult for us to understand and um, much more work needs to happen because it wasn't just your typical, say a 10 pound pike uh, would be super loaded because it's contaminants and a small one wouldn't. In fact, it'd be the opposite in some cases, which didn't, doesn't really make sense in terms of um, toxicology and you know how these things bioaccumulate. So, um, we do know that there's local sources at the same time the landfills are are not landfills they're basically just places where garbage is dumped that ultimately permeates the their water basins there's a lot of other issues that are going on so contaminants is something um i mean at the same time i mean the food when you say well the food's relatively safe it's like when people uh, we work with toxicologists who have said that whole risk benefit thing is not a really strategic or not a, it's not a moral way to go about it because we don't really understand all all the risks and um, you know, to say the benefits outweigh them, we do know we can say food is relatively safe in the communities we work in, but we definitely know contaminants are present. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions here, but I, I have one. I was just wondering, is there, um, is there a mechanism or a platform for sharing um, knowledge, I guess, about how to restore or enhance traditional food systems amongst indigenous communities in Canada? Um, so that's a really good question. And, and it's something that we've been talking about. I, I, I think there, there are some kind of smaller ones. There's nothing like kind of universally adapted ones, say for example, with, um, you know, whether it's a, a tribal organization or even Health Canada, which I think is something we're we're looking to work with communities for knowledge mobilization and how do we get different regions understanding there's so much there's so much interest from commu community members to to find out what's going on in Nunavut or what's going on in Northwest Territories or what's going on in you know other regions what about food sharing what are the, what are you guys doing for freezer programs and it's it's been amazing I've I've done talks like this for even with you know when we bring our indigenous our partners in with us to these talks it's amazing that it's like, oh, you're doing that. I never heard of that. And it just seems like there's so many ideas that are, they're not novel. There's are things that are, you know, like that if they were shared, it would be so much mutual benefit for, you know, mm -hmm. practitioners, for government, for researchers, and more importantly, communities that are so interested in, in learning about different ways of optimizing land food sources and the distribution aspects around it. Mm -hmm. And from north to south as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Trevor has a question. Thank you, Michael. Could you also speak about the challenges that come from being a researcher who has moved from the humanities to social sciences to health research? Well, Francois might be able to answer that too, because um, I think Francois just learns that I use periods and paragraphs. Um, but um, no, it, you know, it's, there's, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, I'm uh, it's so funny, my, I have a PhD student today who asked me a diabetes question and I said, I don't know. And so I sent it to my physiology colleagues and we're, you know, giving um, robust answers. And I mean, I don't know if I'm just lazy. I'd rather not have to do the work. If I can turn to Francois and say, hey, Francois, what's this fish? Why, you know, why does it do that? Or, you know, what about this bird? I mean, I'll do my stuff. And I really, I, I'm a sponge. I love to hear, you know, the, the, the opportunities for, um, working together um, is is incredible, and so uh, I, I just see it. I, the only like the, the only real challenge has really been like when you're looking for funding, how do you position social science, kind of humanities, and then you know the biophysical sciences? Mm -hmm. How do you write papers that kind of satisfy audiences? That's um, you know I think Francois and I have gotten better at it, but it's um, it's it's that's probably the hardest part, and it's about your audience. It's not about working together. I, I've, I've just absolutely benefited and I love working that way. All right, one last question it looks like here from Luke. Uh, he says, thanks for the great presentation. You mentioned that the community wasn't surprised by your original health research results. 
How did they re react to your research results showing the limitations of traditional foods in providing for the food needs of the community? And how did they envision their food system in the future? Yeah, so the I guess, you know, again, this is uh, uh, lesson number one. I mean, it's like, you know, when you provide a report to the communities, you know, I remember one of the elders had said, oh, good, here's another report to gather dust on a shelf. It's like, we already know we want more traditional food. And that was the, the kind of thing that, so they, it wasn't so much they didn't, it wasn't they didn't have it quantified. It was more the idea that, um, you know, there's limits to getting this, this food and people want more of it. That was, that was kind of a clear thing. And so for us to tell them that in a research report wasn't that useful. Um, the issue about, you know, that they, if you think about this region and uh, people, people know where Sandy Lake is, well, Sandy Lake became famous for its uh, highest uh, prevalence of, um, of type two diabetes and obesity in the world. And so they, people in Sandy Lake became pathologized is that it's genetic. I'm from Sandy Lake. Well, gosh, I'm, I'm going to get, you know, eventually I'm going to get diabetes. And so um, the, um, what was interesting, our results were the exact same as they were in Sandy Lake, because basically this is not specific to one community or, and so um, people are, we're aware of these were, you know, there's a health burden in the communities. They recognize this is just one of many different types of issues uh, in terms of health disparities that communities are facing. The only thing that was a bit of a surprise, or I guess was a concern and still is a concern is the issue of the contaminants. Um, and there's not an easy way of even resolving or thinking about that. And so, um, and so I guess in terms of their envisioning of the, of the food system, I mean, it's, it's something that I think that this is, I, 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 I'm not really sure, like, that's the questions we ask. I don't know how, if people have solutions to how to empower it because I mean, if you think about, again, the cost, the people who are basically, who have the, the jobs and have money are able to get on the land and the people who can't, who need the food most, who can't even afford from the store, they're the ones who can't hunt because they don't have the ability in terms of the, the money to ultimately do it. So it's, it's, it's a really, um, yeah, it's a difficult thing. And I think looking at the economics around this is something that we're starting to kind of, um, in terms of potential food distributions around some microeconomy might be another way to help exchange. So the, the exchange part is a critical um, piece in all of this. I, well, there is one last question if you're, if you're willing to, to answer this one. Um, have you used, this is from Andrea, have you used the results of your work to help inform resource allocation to indigenous subsistence use and the assessing of what might be available for other other users like recreational hunters and fishers? Um, so the, our, our work is, you know, again, we are trying to, um, we've been consulted by Health Canada on it kind of informally about kind of the cost aspects. And that's kind of what our work has been able to kind of give a sense of, you know, what are the costs and why, when you're invested in this, what, you know, what does 10 million look like? Does this do anything? And that's kind of the initial conversations. In terms of the recreation part, again, our communities where we are, are so remote, there's no um, other than the occasional paddler who, light, who lights uh, muskeg on fire, which burns for 10 years. Um, there's very few um, people who actually are in this region. It's so remote. So it hasn't been that much of an issue for us. Well, there is one last question, which is very short from Tatiana. What kind of contamination is considered to be the most uh, concern in this part of the North? Well, they're, I mean, they all are. I mean, we, the studies, I mean, again, Francois might be able to speak a bit more to this, but basically we were looking primarily at, you know, in, in PCBs and mercury were the biggest things in terms of, we weren't expecting to see the, the PCBs as high as they were, um, in particular, because again, they're typically more in the higher Arctic, um, but we did see um, still pretty elevated uh, in humans and in um, some of the food sources, um, which was, again, we're not quite understanding that too much, if it's local um, dumping or what's going on. Um, but mercury, which is, um, you know, obviously that's, that's present in, um, in fish and that was the biggest, hey, Francois, I guess fish, fish uh, mercury was the biggest indicator in terms of our dietary assessments, I guess. Yeah, so it was the best indicator by far, but even PCBs were pretty good indicators too, and all coming from fish. Mm -hmm. Well, I think our time is up and I don't see any more questions, so Thank you so much, Michael, for your presentation and this uh, research, which is so important. And I think from judging from the chat box that uh, you've got a lot of uh, appreciation for your presentation today. And thanks to you also, Francois, for your contributions.
I think I'm going to pass it over to Jasmine now, perhaps to wrap things up. Or Maya. Hey. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can take it from here. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael, for such an interesting talk. And I think, yeah, as Mary said, there are so, so many great questions and things to think about when we're considering food security in the North. Um, yeah, so thanks again for taking the time to share your research with us today. Uh, thank you, Mary, for helping with uh, the introduction and moderating our question and answer today, uh, and Maya for siphoning the questions from the chat box and kind of organizing them for us. Uh, you'll see Maya posted something in the chat that has a bit of information about some upcoming events with the Sustainability Council. Um, and so we would love to see you at those, um, those other events if they pique your interest. Um, and thank you to our audience members today. Thanks for coming out and uh, learning more with us today. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, yeah, so we'll close things up now. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Don't go skating on that canal. <laughs>